Daniel Joseph is a serious contender. Hello and welcome to the beginning of wisdom. I'm Andrew Schumacher. Daniel Joseph is the head of Corner Fringe Ministries, uh, and that's also a church where he's the lead pastor, and they are part of the Torah movements, and they are Torah observant. In fact, Joseph himself has no problem calling their movement or their group Hebrew Roots. Now, when I first got into apologetics, I wanted two things to be sort of markers of this ministry, and I don't know if I've ever talked about them, but two of those things were, number one, to get to the truth, even if I end up changing my mind about something. And that's happened sometimes even in videos, you know, where I've changed my mind about a passage where I used to think one thing and then thought another. Um, The second thing is that I want to really address the best of what the other side has to offer. I don't just want to deal with the lightweights. I don't want to deal with just the silliness. I want to find the best that they can muster for arguments for the other side and tackle that. Um, I want to deal with a serious contender. Daniel Joseph is a serious contender. Um, I first learned about him even before I really knew what Torah observance was. I was studying things about the Trinity, and he had a series that he was doing at his church on what he called on the triune nature of God. He didn't really use the word Trinity much, but he liked that other uh, phrase better. And When he went through that series, he had so many references and connections to things in the Old Testament that I had never seen, and I'd never really heard discussed or taught by most teachers when discussing the Trinity up to that point. So I was very blessed by what Daniel Joseph had to offer in that area. Um, And in over time, I've watched some of his sermons and and seen what he says about certain key texts and things like that. And I've also noticed that he does approach some of those key texts when it comes to Torah observance, whether it's, you know, texts that are often appealed to by Torah observers or texts that seem to go against Torah observance. And so there's got to be a way, you know, to, you know, discuss that and and handle it um, and address the, the challenge. And I've noticed that he addresses those challenges sometimes differently from other Torah observance teachers. So I have a lot of respect for Daniel Joseph, um, but I haven't really responded much to things he's said uh, in on this channel or in this ministry, mostly because he doesn't do a lot of apologetics himself. Uh, he mostly does sermons. He preaches through the Bible um, and you know, that's that's kind of what he does. And certainly I could go and, and find one of those key texts and deconstruct his uh, his sermon or something like that. And, but it just never seemed the best thing to, to do with my time. So I have dealt with who I think are, are very serious contenders at various times. I think that uh, folks like 119 Ministries are doing the very best they can and actually trying to make sense out of some of these passages that that don't really fit with their worldview. Um, And, you know, honestly, it is fun sometimes to address those non-serious people, you know, like a Sean Griffin or a Zach Bauer, who who aren't serious students of the Bible, and they're going to, they're going to argue for what they want and, and not really deal with any serious uh, challenges. Um, So that's fun too, but I really would rather take on more serious people. Uh, and I have been trying to do that more lately, you know, dealing with uh, Tim Haig in one of my videos about uh, the book of Hebrews. And as I continue that series, I, I will deal more with with what he says in his commentary. But anyway, coming back to Daniel Joseph, um, he recently started something just a few months ago on why Christians should keep the law. He, these aren't sermons for his church. They are, I mean, they probably are for his church too, but they're YouTube videos that are just short, simple arguments for why he believes Christians ought to keep the law. And so this is him get getting into apologetics a little bit more. Um, I know he's, he's capable of that, you know, don't get me wrong, but just, I just haven't seen that coming out of him uh, as much. And 
in just a few months, he's got over 75 videos now, um, quite, a, quite a library that he's already created. And I thought, you know, this presents a great opportunity. Um, I can take one of the, the best trained teachers in the movement, um, somebody who's not, you know, heretical as far as I can tell in terms of the essentials of the faith. Uh, he is a Trinitarian. He believes in sola fide. Uh, he just doesn't, he just thinks that Christians ought to keep the law. So, so he's made these videos arguing for that. So these videos present a great opportunity to engage with arguments for Torah observance coming from one of the best teachers out there on that subject. And just, I wanted to do it extemporaneously, just without a script, without a bunch of prior study or having heard what Daniel Joseph had to say beforehand. Uh, what I'm going to actually do is you're going to watch me <laughs> watch the videos uh, for the first time, and I will go ahead and respond as I, as I can understand it, uh, you know, as I'm seeing it. And that'll be true except for the first video. I've watched the first video on the series, of course, just to kind of get an idea of what he's, what he's doing, but it's been a while since I saw that, so this, it'll be pretty much first time for that too. Uh, that video was mostly an introduction from what I remember anyway. Um, now, I do want to be somewhat organized, and, and that's because I have really more than one goal when it comes to doing something like this. I don't just want to create a video responding to an argument, and that's all it is. What I also want to do is equip the saints to be able to do this kind of thing on their own. And so I'm going to have, my responses will be somewhat organized, and this is going to be, again, to the best of my ability. I'm going to try to do three things with each video. Uh, number one is I'm going to ask, you know, what kind of argument is he making? And what would that argument prove if he's right? Uh, number two I'm going to look at that argument's strengths and weaknesses and, and see how well we can do with that. And then number three, I'm going to ask, you know, how does a right understanding of the law and the Christian's res response to the law and how we, how we approach it, how does that overcome the argument if it even has to? Uh, I mean, sometimes he might make an argument that I don't really have a, an issue with, um, but I you know, I may have a slight, slightly different interpretation or slightly different. I may point out that his, his conclusion is, you know, smuggling something in, but, but most of what he said is just fine. We'll see. <laughs> but I don't want to explain these, these three things too much right now. I think you'll kind of understand them better just by watching me do them. So you'll get it as we go, but let's go ahead and jump into the first video. I just got to say one thing already. Um, I don't know what it is, but everybody in the Torah movements, they all have these very fancy uh, intros. <laughs> lots of animation, lots of stuff going on, uh, music, uh, the whole the whole thing. It's it's all very 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 fancy. <laughs> um, I I hope to someday be able to do stuff like that, but. Uh, anyway, let's let's get into the video. Welcome, everyone, to our new video series project called Why Christians Should Keep the Law. This is going to be a very comprehensive and a very lengthy series. However, having said that, so as to not overwhelm you, we are breaking up each segment into roughly 10-minute videos or less. Uh, so as to not overwhelm. And so, um, if I may use the analogy of a puzzle, uh, this series is very much like a puzzle. You dump out all the pieces of the puzzle and you put this puzzle together one piece at a time. And only after you start collecting all these pieces and, and put them together, 
only then can you see the picture that is being portrayed on the puzzle. Only then does it come into view. I I'll say, first of all, he's, he's absolutely right. <laughs> this, is how, this is how you're supposed to do um, good biblical theology, is you don't just take one thing and build your theology on one little part of scripture and what that says, and then make the rest of it all fit. Now, whether he successfully does what he's saying is, is another, another question. Now, I don't know if he's saying what I just said, you know, that this is how we, how scripture works, that you, you, you learn things and, and you learn little bits about God through the narratives and through the, the teaching that's in there. And then, you know, things all kind of fit together and, and, you, and you get a bigger and bigger picture. Um, what it, seems, it sounds like he's saying is, you know, he's going to address various arguments or talk about various arguments for Torah observance and, and how they might establish one little thing here and one little thing there. But then the theology all gets established through this, all of these little arguments. And that's, that's fine. I think that's a, a fine way to do it. Um, no, no issue from me uh, with anything he said so far. I want you to understand that this series is the very same way and that, you know what, each piece, each video that we release in and of itself is going to be incomplete as it pertains to the subject as a whole. It's a piece of the puzzle. Only after we put this all together is this going to make sense? And so I mention this because I'm going to encourage you to actually see it all the way through, to journey with us in this series all the way to the end. We will be virtually going from Genesis to Revelation, scouring the Word of God to see what it has to say about the law of God, whether it's relevant for a believer in Jesus or whether it's not. We will be analyzing the teachings of Jesus. Will we be looking at the teachings of Paul? And I will also be looking at what does he mean by relevant? Um, you know, that's a, that's a big question because there, there's more than just two answers to that question. There's is it relevant or is it not? But also, is it relevant in the way that he is going to argue that it is? And, and we'll, we'll test that as we go. We will be getting into common objections of what typically keeps a Christian away from the law. You know, if, if, <clears throat> if you're a pastor and you're wondering why you have congregants coming up to you and talking to you about the law or what they would call the Torah or that they are now keeping the Sabbath or that they are now not eating pork and you're wondering what is going on. Why are these people returning back to the law, putting themselves under a curse? Well, then I'm going to tell you this series is going to be for you. You're going to want to go through this. If you're one of those Christians that grew up as I did, that look at the law of God as the antithesis to grace, and that any attempt to submit oneself under the law of God is nothing more than this feeble attempt than you trying to earn your own salvation. And ultimately, your submission to the law is rejection of Jesus himself. If you're one of those Christians, I'm going to tell you, this series is going to be for you. If you're just simply a Christian that is seeking to investigate what all the hullabaloo is about, why you have friends, which you feel might be going off the deep end, but you're not quite sure, you haven't been able to articulate it through the word, this series is going to be for you. And so I just encourage all of you to take this journey with us piece by piece. With that said, I want to open up and I, I want to take the title of this series and I want to change it to a question. And instead of saying why Christians should keep the law, let's ask the questions, why should Christians keep the law? And I can give a one-word answer to that. And I'm going to tell you, it's this one word that governs the entirety of this discussion. It is foundational to everything that we are going to cover throughout 
this series. Everything is built upon this one word. And what is that? That is Jesus. There is no other reason for a Christian to keep the law than because they're a believer in Jesus. And this is interesting. Um, and it's a question I've had and something that I've talked about here and there. And that is just how does the law, I've talked a lot about how does the law relate to Christians, right? Um, but I've mentioned from time to time that I wonder, well, how does the law relate to unbelievers? Should unbelievers keep the law? And from the way that many in the Torah movements talk about the law, you would think, well, yes, of course. I mean, the law defines sin and everybody's a sinner and they're sinners for breaking the law. So yeah, the it applies to unbelievers just the same as Christians. Um, if If they come down sort of like that, that it's just, it applies to Christians the same as it applies to everybody else, then what Daniel Joseph just said doesn't really, I mean, it sounds good, but it doesn't really have any, any weight to it. Why should Christians keep the law? Well, because everybody should, because it's God said, right? And, and Jesus, you know, maybe he came and he was an example, okay, but that's not the fundamental reason. Obviously, Jesus wasn't around in the Old Testament in the way he is now, uh, you know, he was, he was God. He's the one who gave the law, <laughs> but he, um, he wasn't the one who had yet had come and lived it uh, as, as a perfect human being. So um, we'll see, like I said, I've, I've watched this first video, but I don't remember how it, it goes. So we'll see what he says about, about you know, as he elaborates on why Jesus is the reason we should keep the law. Here's the deal. When we understand who Jesus is, when we understand what he taught and what he desires from us, his followers, and what true relationship actually looks like, what does the Bible describe as a healthy relationship between Jesus and his followers, I'm going to tell you, only then are you going to find yourself, instead of running away from the law, you're going to be running to the law. Now, I want to open up by taking you to the gospel of John, to the words of Jesus. He has an amazing lesson for us today. He says this in John chapter 5, verse 46, he says, for if you believed Moses, now I want to stop here because what, what is Jesus talking about? He's talking about the law of Moses. He's talking about Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The first five books of the Bible uh, are, ID, are identified as the law or the Torah or the Humash or by Christian scholars, the Pentateuch goes by many names or just simply the law of Moses. And everything else that follows would be considered the writings and the prophets. I'll say this and maybe he'll elaborate a little bit, but I do want to point out um, in the Bible, when the law or the law of Moses is discussed, sometimes it means what Daniel Joseph just said, that it's it's the, those first five books of Moses. And it's just, it's given that moniker of the law, the instructions, the Torah, whatever that term, because it contains the, the law in commandments, the, the commandments given at Sinai and, and uh, at, at the Jordan, you know, before coming into the land in Deuteronomy. The, the law, you know, so it's called that, but, and, and even in some passages, there are definitely some passages that, that in the New Testament that re refer to parts of the Torah, parts of the first five books as the law, but then when they talk about it, they're not talking about commandments. They're talking about something in the narrative. And so he's, he's not wrong, that, but, at the, but on the other hand, what he's saying is a little bit misleading. It, it makes it sound like what Jesus said is, if you understood all the commandments of Moses, then you, know, you would believe me. But that's not exactly what Jesus is saying. 
it's included in what Jesus is saying. If you understood the commandments, but also if you understood everything Moses wrote, if you understood the book of Genesis or the book, you know, the the stories found in Numbers and and, and Deuteronomy and things like that, um, then you would you would believe me. But it's it's a little bit um, incomplete in, in a way that can be misleading to say. Oh, it, you know, when Jesus said, if you believe Moses, he's talking about the law of Moses. Again, he properly identifies that as the first five books, but that's not exactly how, what, you know, the conversation that we're having. I, I don't think that he has to convince anyone, any Christians, that they should believe that the things in the first five books of Moses are true. Um, nobody, you know, no conservative believing Christian is out there saying, well, that that didn't happen or that wasn't that God never told them to do that. You know, nobody's disbelieving except the unbelievers. <laughs> um, but he's not talking about unbelievers, he's talking about Christians. So it's again, if he's if he's thinking that that's a, a real argument for, you know, keeping certain commandments, um, then that's an, an equivocation. You know, he's, he's equivocating on the term law. Does law, is he using law to refer to the books or is he using law to refer to the commandments? And both of those things happen in the New Testament. And so we have to be clear on what we mean when we use those terms. And so Jesus comes and says, for if you believed in the law of Moses, okay, if you believe the law of Moses, you would believe me for he wrote about me. Now, I'm going to tell you, in my personal faith journey, this was life-changing for me. This absolutely changed my life. See, because I, as a Christian, was of the opinion that the law has actually nothing to do. It's antiquated. It's outdated. has nothing to do with Christ. I want to progress in Christ. And so I would, I was actually of the mindset, I, I don't want anything to do with the law. I'm not going to go back there. I didn't study the law. When I came across this passage, I was dumbfounded. Because as I was reading and reading it many times to make sure I understood what Jesus was talking about, no matter how many times I read it, I kept understanding that Jesus is calling me to the law of Moses to come and seek him. Now, I'm going to tell you, this is... Notice what Jesus was calling us to and, and calling the, the Pharisees to he was talking to. If you understood or I, if you believed the law of Moses, you would believe me. It's, it's one thing, you know, I, if, if you know what I've talked about, talking about Torah observance and, and the bad arguments for uh, keeping the various uh, parts of the law that that are covenantally tied and aren't part of the new covenant in, in any you know obligatory way but are but are part of the new covenant in terms of being fulfilled prophecy and things like that uh, if you if you've heard me talk about that at all you know that I don't think that we have to do certain things in the law the way that it that they did um, when those laws were given but that doesn't mean I don't believe them that's a totally different question. And Jesus doesn't say if you, and, and frankly, even if he had said this, it wouldn't change much. He, he doesn't say if you kept the law of Moses, then you would believe me. He says, if you believed Moses, if you believed what Moses said, you would believe me. And that's because Moses, that's not really primarily because of commandments. It's because of things that Moses said about Christ, you know, the, the one that pops into my mind right away is when he said there's, you know, another prophet that'll come uh, in Deuteronomy. So, yeah, there, this is a little, again, this is, he's, he's kind of equivocating on, on what he's talking about. Is he talking about commandments or is he talking about just the scriptures and what is contained in the words and whether they're true? Um, those aren't necessarily the same thing again. my testimony. After reading this, I began to read the law of Moses seeking Jesus, not seeking to earn my own salvation. I was seeking him. And guess what? I found him in the most profound 
way imaginable. I was dumbfounded by the amount of messianic prophecies that were embedded within the law, which I thought had nothing to do with anything Christian or anything to do with Christ. Amen to that. I was dumbfounded by the typologies, these messianic typologies that were all over the place. We have men of the likes of Adam. You, you, you think of, of Abel and what Abel experienced. He was killed because of his, of his righteousness. And um, you think about Moses himself. You think about Joseph. We think about Isaac. And, and Abraham took Isaac, which was called his only son, to sacrifice him. I mean, you, you, and I don't need him need to. Notice that he's talking primarily about Genesis. You know, he's talking primarily about a part of the law that doesn't have law, so to speak. It doesn't have very much in the way of commandments for us. Uh, very, very, very few. Uh, there are a few, but it's, it's very few. Uh, everything he's talking about is typology regarding these people. And, and I agree 100%. Um, that, that's absolutely true. Get into the, the reality of that typology. This is all of these things were foreshadowing what Jesus himself would go through, what Jesus himself would experience. And you think about the life of Joseph, he was betrayed by his brothers. This is exactly what happened to Jesus. But what they meant for evil, God meant for good. Even when the people rejected him, when Jesus was rejected by his own brothers, it was for their good. It was ultimately so that he could save all humanity. Absolutely beautiful. But here's the other thing that I found in regard to the law. I found the character of Jesus. His character and his love. I didn't expect to find his love in the law, because all I thought the law was, was condemnation. I found his character. I found his love. I found his wisdom. I found his understanding. I found his personality. I found his likes. I found his dislikes. It was incredible. The, the, the amount of wisdom, his wisdom and his understanding, I began to actually have this very in-depth relationship with the Lord through something I thought had nothing to do with Jesus whatsoever. That, that, that's mind-blowing. Now, let me build on this, and I want to take you to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14. The apostle Paul throws his hat into the ring. He says this, but their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ. And then he says this, but even to this day, when Moses is read, what is he talking about? The law of Moses. When the law of Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now, did you understand that? Do you understand how, how insane is this? The Apostle Paul, what he just communicated is that the law of Moses is only for the believer in Jesus. The true riches of the kingdom of God, the beauty, the mysteries of God, the wisdom and the understanding, it's only going to be given to believers in Jesus, to those believers who follow after him, who seek him. So, somewhat of an answer to the earlier question, right? Is the law for believers or is it for the whole world? Seems like Daniel Joseph is coming down on the side of it's for believers. It's not for the whole world. And so that brings up a question I will have uh, that maybe he'll answer during this series. How exactly, you know, in what way are the, or based on what, are the unbelievers judged? They sin. How is their sin regarded as sin? If the law is only for believers. Again, we, we need to know kind of what that means uh, for Daniel Joseph. What an awesome lesson for us. That's all we have time for today. Look forward to seeing you in the next episode.
Lord bless you. All right. So let's talk a little bit about uh, what, what we heard there. Um, not really a, a single argument. This is sort of an introductory video, but um, it seems like the, the thrust of his, his perspective what is what he wanted to share was, look, Jesus said, if you believe Moses, you'd believe me. And the things Moses said pertain to me. And he thought, he had thought that they don't pertain to him as a Christian. Uh, they're, they're not, they're just irrelevant uh, to the Christian. So, but then he learned, well, yes, they do pertain to the Christian. And so he, it, it made him want to learn even more and, and obviously led to the desire to keep the law and to go and and do the do everything that that he can and and he hasn't defined that in specific detail so I'm not going to I'm not going to either but um he's arguing we should keep the law because of, of this this thing that he learned so what kind of argument is he making um he's he's essentially making the argument that uh and it's a it's a biblical argument that Look, Jesus affirmed Moses. Moses said, you know, he said, if you believe Moses, you believe me. He's affirming Moses. He's not denying or, or saying, hey, you shouldn't listen to Moses. Um, the, the part there at the end was a little bit, um, a, a little confusing. Let me actually, I'm going to go ahead and jump back over here. And I, I'm going to actually go back to that spot. All right, I'm back. I'm going to play this part <laughs> um, again here at the end because I wanted to catch what he was saying there because it sounded a little odd. So let's uh, let's play that again. It's taken away in Christ. And then he says this. But even to this day, when Moses is read, what is he talking about? The law of Moses. When the law of Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now, did you understand that? Do you understand how, how insane is this? The Apostle Paul, what he just communicated is that the law of Moses is only for the believer in Jesus. The true riches of the kingdom of God, the beauty, the mysteries of God, the wisdom and the understanding, it's only going to be given to believers in Jesus, to those believers who fight. Okay, now I understand. So he's saying... When they turn to Jesus, the veil's taken away, meaning now they can read the law of Moses and not have a veil on their hearts. It's, it's when the unbeliever reads the law of Moses that he has his veil, but the believer in Jesus does not. Got it. <laughs> okay. So, um, and this is why he's saying it's only for the believer. Uh, and and I, I see what he's saying. Now, I... I don't know that I agree with this particular um, take. It seems like he's he's kind of ignoring because uh, it doesn't say, um, you know, it says when they turn to Jesus, the veil's taken away. But the the natural reading of of what is said there is that, well, let me put it this way: what he's saying is not in any way incompatible with the traditional Christian view of the law. The, the traditional Christian view says, look, the Old Testament all points to Jesus. It's all ultimately aimed right at him. And so if you don't have him, it's, it doesn't make sense. And, you know, it doesn't fully make sense. It, it gets you up to a point and then, you know, it, it's an incomplete book. I've, I've 
made a, a couple of videos talking about that, how you know it's it's purposefully incomplete without the New Testament. The New Testament is on purpose to complete what was set up in the Old Testament. So yes, the Old Testament is for believers. And there's there are other passages that talk about that, that it was written for our benefit. Um, Paul says that in, in more than one place. But the other thing that's being said here is, is that the, the law of Moses is now replaced by Jesus. Now, that's not to say that every single thing in there is, is replaced by Jesus, that every single commandment, because not every commandment found in the law of Moses is, is originated in the law of Moses. There are lots and lots of commandments and we find this when we read Genesis, that, that a lot of those commandments are just reflections of earlier, uh, earlier law uh, because we see those sins described, you know, like with Joseph and, and Cain and, and all those things. Um, but the fact is that uh, what Paul is also talking about is that you know, if when they're reading, when they're just reading the Old Testament, and that's that's all they are focused on, and they're not reading it in light of Christ, then yeah, a, a veil covers their eyes. But Christ takes that away, and and so it's it's not something that that is complete in in and of itself. I think he would actually agree with all of that, and I would, you know, so I don't. Again. Is it for us? Yes. But is it for us in the way that Daniel Joseph is arguing that it's for us, that we are supposed to do everything in there just the way the ancient Israelites did? Uh, and, and of course, I would say no. So what kind of argument is he making? He, he's making a, an analogous argument. He's Essentially, he's saying, again, if, if Moses is good, you know, Moses is good, says Jesus, so we should, we should follow Moses. Um, but you know, the, and this is a, a good, strong argument in the sense that it is uh, sticking with the Bible. I really appreciate that. It's not trying to get into a whole bunch of hypothetical thoughts or, you know, other philosophies or other Talmudic stuff. You know, he's not bringing in all that other stuff. He's just saying, look, this is what the Bible says. And that's good. That It, it makes it strong. The weakness of his argument is that it, it only... Um, it, it doesn't really uh, prove as much as he seems to think it, it will. Now, he, he himself said, like, this isn't, no single video in this series is going to be complete. But my point is, he, as, a, as a traditional Christian believer who, who, who loves the whole Bible, I can affirm everything he said without having to affirm that that we, you know, are supposed to be keeping the Saturday Sabbath or that we're supposed to be eating kosher or those specific things um, because there's more to the story than just the fact that Jesus said something good about Moses or that the law of Moses is ultimately for the Christian in, in terms of the, the proper understanding of it. Um, I would say, yes, that's absolutely true uh, and that it's actually, you know, what he says or what his conclusion ultimately is that doesn't take Jesus into account in the proper way. Um, but I'm sure we'll get there. Um, so I guess that's kind of what I've got for this one. So uh, I hope you enjoyed it and I will see you in the next video.